Hi, I'm Darlene Carmen. And I'm Doug Carmen. And welcome to the show. Liz Cunningham has found her place in the bucket chain, the growing linkage of people at work and in service to preserve the life of this earth. She utilizes the same writing skills as for her first book, but the subject has changed from politics to oceans. Ocean Country describes the adventures of Liz Cunningham's research covering three regions around the world within one year. Wow, that's quite a feat, <laughs> quite a journey you had there. Good to be here, Darlene. And, and that's remarkable, but the fact is that you almost lost your life in the ocean from a kayak accident. Now that just takes it to a whole new level. Can you tell us what happened? Sure, it was a little over 19 years ago and I was in a whitewater kayak in the surf here off the coast. And uh, I was actually surfing and having a really good time, and suddenly I s felt something strange, and I looked behind me, and there was a huge rogue wave. And the next thing I knew, I had had a concussion, and I was upside down in the kayak with my head facing the bottom of the ocean. And I felt like I was in a washing machine. <laughs> and so, you know, to get out of a whitewater kayak, you do something called a wet exit, and you, you take your hands and you pull off the skirt, the spray skirt of the kayak, and then push yourself out and I went to do that and my arms had been paralyzed because my back had been injured oh. so I for you know I don't know how long a minute perhaps I was bargaining I was saying please please no this isn't happening and then finally I realized oh my god I'm dying this is really happening and I went away into a place where I couldn't see anything but I could still hear and a voice asked me do you want to live and so I said, yes. And then suddenly my eyes bolted open and I had this painful shivering in my arms and I had feeling. And so then I went and I grabbed the skirt and I pushed myself out of the kayak and there it was in the surface of the water, kind of coughing up water. And oh, thank God I had a life preserver because I definitely wouldn't have been able to stay afloat then. Wow, that's quite a story. Oh, well, five years later, uh, you kind of had a setback. Um, how did that affect you? When, yeah, yeah, well, I was struggling with my health. I think for about a decade, I was really struggling with my health. And I got a little bit better, but I had a lot of chronic pain, and I had occasional numbness in my arms. And then I got hit with a period of really intense fatigue and problems with dizziness and infections. And finally, I was uh, diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease, which is an autoimmune disease. But also during that time, there's something very powerful about illness. It gives you time to think. And mm -hmm. during that time, I really understand how deeply I love the ocean. So even though it, it almost dished me up as chum, <laughs> I, still really, I still really loved the ocean and had a tremendous longing for it. And that's when I started to write about it. Oh, that's, that's just amazing to me, even to get back into the ocean after all that. Yeah. And that was kind of exciting yeah. on the process. Yeah. But, well, from, from the dives that you've done, there's one that was very upsetting to you when you went out and you found that all of a sudden the coral just bleached within one week. Yeah. So please tell us that story and its significance. Yeah, I was in the Turks and Caicos Islands and I had been doing research there and there was one specific spot that was very near and dear to my heart and uh, I was there in June of 2012 and that site, to me, it just absolutely kind of exploded with life. And a week later, we went back to it, and um, it, I went down, and I, you know, I, got, I put my gear on and went down to water, and I thought, I don't know where I am. Wow. And the reef had bleached, and there were practically no fish, like one fish here and one fish there, where there were once schools mm -hmm. of fish. I think we have a photo of that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can pull up and have a look. Can yeah. we see that and photo? It's, covered with algae. There, there oh, we there are. There it is. There it is. So that, that month, NOAA uh, had recorded the highest sea and temperature, air temperatures recorded in history. And it was a five degree spike. I think actually, no, four degree spike up from 78 degrees to 82 degrees. And that is from climate change. But there were also stresses due to nutrient runoff and pollution on that reef. But the impact that it had on me was I was tremendously sad, but then it made me start asking questions because I felt like, what don't I understand about what's happening to the earth? And it also set me on the course of looking for hope. Where is the hope in this? What can we do about this? 
Well, more about the reef. I mean, how can how can four degrees yeah. take so much away in one week's right. time? Yeah. And then, of course, the effect on the fish. Yes. If, if reading about exactly. it, I know that the fish just disappear. Yes. We think they go deeper. Um, the reef itself had been under stress for decades due to overfishing, pollution, and then what's called nutrient runoff, which are fertilizers and sunscreen, things like that. Sunscreen. But the heat is the last straw. It's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And it's the same thing with your body. You can say, OK, 100 degrees, 101, 102. And, and it's just like that. And that's enough to kill, kill Yeah, because coral the are, they're coral. animals. They have stomachs. They mate. They're, you know, they're animals. They have the same kind of biological restrictions that other animals have. But they can't run and hide from the heat. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and they don't vote. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that, they don't vote. That was terribly, terribly upsetting. Well, you know, we're experiencing a drought right here in California right yeah. now. Yeah. But uh, it's nothing to, to, uh, compared to what you found in, in Indonesia. Yes. Where they, um, I think they, they ration like 10 gallons of water for a family of five per week. Yeah. How, you know, what kind of circumstances cause that situation where you could have to ration to only 10 gallons for a large family? Yeah. That's for, that seems yeah. almost impossible. Yeah, and it was a really powerful experience for me to go and do this research m for myself because I felt like, well, I'm informed and I, I know there are problems with water or I know there's problems with the ocean or I know there's problems with the environment. But I went on a boat to a small village called Kasawari and there was a man there named Ronnie, and I think we have a picture for that as well that you guys could pull you up. Want to see it now? Yeah. Can we see let's, a picture of Ronnie? Let's pull up that picture. So, and I went and I talked to Ronnie, Is that and, Ronnie? and yeah, and he he explained to me that um, there's less fish, uh, uh, there's more plastic in the water, and you know, at the end of the interview, I said, "Well, is there anything else that you want to tell me?" And he said, "Yeah," and I said, "What?" And he said, well, "We need water." And I felt like a windshield that shattered. I was like, what? And he explained, well, there's less fish, but when we have enough fish, then we sell the fish. And we use that money to go to the water plant to get fresh water. And we get about 10 gallons. And we try and make that last a week. And his <coughs> wife and three kids were looking at me. And at that moment, they made eye contact with me. And I'm writing this down. But it was so much more real to be there with him and I remember that day, I, you know, I had my notebook and I said, I'm going to promise that I tell his story because it was much more real to be there face to face and see the look on his face. But the causes for that are pollution, yeah. lack of waste management. In Southeast Asia and the Caribbean, 80 to 90 percent of sewage is discharged into the ocean. And it's also an issue of lack of water treatment plants. So all those things, and the other thing is because of climate change, sea levels are rising, so salt water is leaching into aquifers, so some of the wells don't have drinkable water anymore. So it's a huge crisis. So yeah, many because things. They certainly don't lack for rain, rainfall in, in Indonesia. Yeah. And yeah, that's quite uh, right. very yeah. tropical yeah. in most cases. So it's what you're, what you're saying, it's just a management that's of a human management of all their their yes. mismanagement yes. Yeah, yeah. of their, their, their current resources yeah. are not able to process. And I guess you said the wells are turning uh, well, yes. back, yeah, the yes. ocean water is leaching back into yeah. some of the land wells. And so th there's a lot that can be done though, and it's investing in waste management, also investing in uh, more water treatment plants, also just educating people about hygiene. That's really important, too. So there are a lot of steps that can happen, and some of them have to do with uh, the governments themselves investing it. And there are a bunch of NGOs as well that are working to stream funds into that area for that very purpose of um, improving now, water quality. when you're quality. traveling to these places, yeah. are you traveling with a huge staff? And no, no. So tell me about how Solo, you Solo, with notebook, and which was really a remarkable experience. Yes. Um, but sometimes I had a traveler. Uh, a uh, translator, and yes. sometimes as well, like there was a village liaison that would come with me or something like that. 
so I wasn't always alone. Did you ever have any problems with the local uh, government? You're, because you're, you're certainly investigating, they might yeah. not want some yeah. information <laughs> yeah. that you're finding. You yeah. know, no, I, you know, I mean, I was traveling alone. Um, you know, writers are seen as pretty innocuous, and I didn't consider myself a kind of hard-bitten journalist. Um, certainly there are areas, there are restrictions for journalists in West Papua, and they don't like people going into lumbering sites there, and there still is a serious problem with freedom of the press in Indonesia. It has not been resolved. Mm. Well, there's so many wonderful people in your book. So um, tell us about somebody you'd like to share. Well, there, there are a lot of people to talk about. But yes. uh, one of the stories that really is one of the most amazing to tell people about are some fishermen that started a collective in Indonesia. And they collectively agreed not to dynamite fish. And they mm. were in southeast Sulawesi. And these guys, they really bowled me over with their courage because they had made the choice to earn maybe 5 to $40 a day compared to what they could earn with dynamite fishing, which is like 85 to $175 a day. And they knew exactly what they were doing. They basically understood that there was so much dynamite fishing that there weren't going to be any fish left. Well, can and, we back up a little bit? Yeah. yeah. They're getting the higher price because they're selling it to black market? It can be black market. It mm -hmm. can also be just the number of fish that you collect. So it can be small scale. It also can be large scale. And in that case, it's linked to or organized crime and narcotics mm -hmm. networks. Yeah, but with more fish, less demand. So it's a yes. better. Yeah. If they, 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 if they went out and got fewer fish, yes. then the price of the fish would go up. Right, so exactly. So they collectively got together and said, we're going to work, stop the dynamiting, yeah. which produced mm -hmm. multiple amounts yeah. of fish. Yeah. But but drove the price down, and and uh, that's a consequence. I guess what you're saying is that they eventually kill off their their resource for fish. They they did have to make a choice to earn less money, but they did it for their communities and they did it for their kids because they knew like down the road another decade or two there they just wouldn't, wouldn't be any fish time. left. How long did that take? The process of time, approximately, for them to come to that conclusion. You know, that's hard to say. It could be two decades. Oh, but in the decade wow. preceding when I visited there, there had been a 75% reduction in dynamite fishing. And they had told me, compared to 10 years before, there were more fish and that things were starting to recover a little bit, which is a really positive sign. So they, so they could actually see for themselves that yeah. uh, if they yeah. had continued with, with this process Not of the, dynamite, the dynamite and fish, they'd exactly. work themselves. Yeah. Right? There's yeah. just nothing after that. And I think one thing that's very powerful about what they did is they took actions in a situation where they felt that things might be totally out of control and things were really just going to hell. And still they decided to make these sacrifices and take a wise step and see where that would take them. So they kind of did this on their own collectively as, as a community rather than any interference by the government. Is that what you're exactly. saying? Exactly, yeah. yeah. That's what's so neat about it. Yeah. I think that some of the NGOs there, our World Wildlife Fund and the Nature Conservancy, there were definitely people there helping them learn more about them. ecosystems. But very much so the collectives themselves are ones that are run by the fishermen and they're self-supporting. Yeah, yeah. Pretty cool. Mm. Oh, that brings up, a, of all the locations, it seems, that you, you've visited around the world, um, what have you found as, as the, the, where you have the, the most variety of fish and, and coral? Yeah, I, you know, well, that was something that was very special for me to go visit, and that was uh, the Raja Ampat area of West Papua, because that is the absolute bullseye, the absolute epicenter of marine biodiversity in the world. And when you're underwater, you can just see it. You're just kind of like, wow, there's fish here, fish here, another new fish, another new fish. And you really, you really notice it. It's a very, very dramatic difference. It's part of the triangle of coral. Yes, it's part uh, of the coral triangle. I mean, a lot of people might not know oh, yeah. where these yes. areas are that yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, West Papua is actually the western half of New Guinea. And after World War II, a bunch of uh, military men, they drew a straight line straight through New Guinea because it's so resource rich. And Indonesia took that western half. Mm. Now, I, I was reading the book, but I didn't write down the figures. Do you have any idea? I mean, the quantity, the different bright, there, uh, 
I don't want to say it, but there was like how many quotes yes, compared yes, uh, yes. to... I'm, yes, I've yeah. been a good student and remembered <laughs> to memorize that, and it is actually 600 species <sighs> of coral, and that's, I believe, 10 times the number of the Caribbean. And then it is, it is 1,500 species of fish, and that's about four times that of, of the Caribbean. I mean, but, it, you know, it's just numbers. But when you get uh, un underwater, you're going, huh, and then you go to a new place, and there are all these brand new fish. I mean, um, coral. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm an artist. I've painted yes. coral. Yeah. I could do, I could maybe do 10. I mean, that might be yeah. a stretch. I yeah. could do 10. I mean, yes. I don't yeah. think people know about these corals. Yeah. They must be totally amazing to see. And, of course, you're... Your photographs yes. underwater. Yeah. Oh, yeah, love to see I those. I think we have one photo that's um, here. We have available that shows a beautiful coral with a school of fish, and I think that one of the things that's really amazing about being there and amazing about biodiversity is there's a very strong correspondence between beauty and survival. And a colleague of mine, Helen Newman, explained that with rice, um, if you have many grains of rice you're much more able to survive a blight because if you have a bad period, one or two of those types of rice will survive. Um, and that's why biodiversity is so important because we're experiencing a lot of problems with the ocean. So it's very important to preserve areas like that that have rich biodiversity because you have more pathways to survival. Mm, that's true. More, more species. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. where, you'll, where some will survive and yes. some will die yes. off. Yes. And so there's a direct correlation then to the amount of coral as there, to the, the, the abundance of fish. Yes. No right. coral, no <laughs> fish. fish. So, yes. so they exactly. do. It's, yeah. That's why coral is so important. Coral yeah. and seagrass, and you mentioned yes. mangroves. mangroves. Oh, yes. Keystone Absolutely. species. The hub All of the of wheel. All of those things are so, so important. Yeah. Coral, yes, yes. yes but also the mangroves yes. and the seagrass yes. uh, because they protect the juveniles. Yes. Yeah. Um, so of all your encounters with the sea life, uh, has there been any special particular fish that you've ever bonded with? Yeah, there was one thing that happened to me in, in West Papua that's really yeah. unforgettable. And it's, it's really amazing. I think sometimes at night when I'm falling asleep, I will go back to that and I will remember that. Ah. And it was, Something that happened to me, when you are diving in West Papua, there are very strong currents. And it's one reason it's so biodiverse, is there are all these different spiraling currents that come in. And some of these currents are as strong as five or six knots. And sometimes when you're going down into a reef, you need to get kind of into a little crevice and tuck yourself away from the current so you don't get swept off the reef. And so going down one day, I wasn't able to do that, and I got swept off the reef. And so then what you should do is you should do a safety stop. And so I was doing a safety stop, but meanwhile, I'm just whizzing away from the reef, wondering if anybody's going to find me. And you have no bearings. You don't know how deep or shallow you are in the water. So I was staring at my dive computer going, OK, 15, 15 feet. And when I was done with my stop, I looked up, and suddenly I see this huge mouth coming at me. And I'm like, what the? <laughs> and it was an oceanic manta. Oh. And its wings were so big that you could, you'd almost think it like drape over an SUV. And it just came right above me. I'm like Ooh. looking, I could almost touch it. And then it turned, and then the tail passed, but didn't touch me very carefully. And right behind it, there were two others. Wow. And they were circling me. And these guys were like sort of gigantic prehistoric water birds. And so the long and the short of it is that they circled me for a while, and I mm -hmm. swam with There's them. One. Yeah. And so I'm swimming with them, and I'm thinking, OK, I should go up. I really should go up and look for land. And then suddenly, all of a sudden, I saw the divers, and I saw the reef. And I was like, what? Did they create a buffer in the current? Did they bring me back? And all I know is I ducked behind a coral knob to get out of the current. And all of a sudden, I saw like these little handkerchief shapes just disappearing. Oof. So this, oh, the, the current 
it, it sweeps you out or does it sweep you down? It sweeps you out. It can <laughs> sweep you down. I have heard tall tales of that as well. But that it can sweep you far currents. enough out that, that yeah. you can lose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Be hard to get back in. Yes, it would be hard to swim You get back. caught in a current and yeah. then you just keep going out and out and yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. Well, those, yeah. those mantas are quiet, aren't they? Yeah, he uh, probably snuck up on you a little bit. <laughs> well, I think I was so tunnel vision about keeping my depth very even uh -huh. that I just was looking at my computer through a straw because <sighs> yeah. well, you don't want to dip down yeah. or up. So you're very focused on maintaining well, your depth. Well, manas, they eat like plankton, or they, they eat do. very micro, yeah, like plankton, yeah. right? Well, they weren't that? hungry to eat her. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, just so, so people know that yeah. a man is not, yeah. it, it doesn't threaten no. you. Yeah, they're not like people. a TV producer that bite your head off or anything. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. But they're very docile as far as yes. humans, as long as you don't yeah. harm yeah, they, them, because they, they, they do have yeah. a stinger, right? Yeah, 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 but they, they feed on microscopic plankton. Fins, yeah. Well, so tiny, tiny, tiny little their, pieces. What do you call them, fins? Yeah. Their wings? That's why they have the big mouth. Yeah. You, you gotta watch out for that. Pew! Yeah, but because you, they're huge. Yeah, absolutely yeah, enormous. Huge, but beautiful. So, uh, yeah, um, in California now we're we're experiencing a drought in in this area. No, you want to talk yeah. about the coastal. Well, uh, yeah, well, yes. <laughs> I'm just trying to remember. Yeah, yeah the, co the coastal <laughs> the, the coastal waters of California are pretty much protected, as I understand. And that's a good thing for California. But what about yeah. the rest of the world? Um, is there other areas, like you were talking about, where they're, yeah, where yeah. they're doing something positive to try to protect yeah. the, the reefs off, off their shoreline? Yeah, you, you know, bet. Or, yeah. You know, realizing that, the, yeah. that this, could, this is very important yeah. for sustainable, um, of sub yeah. sustainability of fishes. And that, yeah. and that could economically to help, you know, help their their industry, their fishing industry. Yeah. Oh, so is anything being done like like in California around the other yeah, parts of the I'm world? Yeah, you know, we're in a really tremendous moment in history that's it's really vital to make a strong effort because right now I think it's somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of land that's set aside as park. Yeah. But it's barely 4 percent of ocean. And there's really a push to get more of the ocean set aside in order to maintain the health of the seas. And so there's a number of different programs. One of my favorites is Sylvia Earle's Mission Blue. And what they are doing are working on getting certain parts of the ocean called hope spots set aside. And one of those hope spots is the Bird's Head Seascape, which is that section of West Papua, which is so biodiverse. But it's definitely a push to get those areas set aside. And it happens through petitions. It happens through lobbying politicians. It happens on a community level. It happens through discussions at the kitchen table. But it's really important, and it's of similar importance, you know, that we needed to set aside parkland. I mean, the ideal goal would be to have 20% of the ocean set aside by 2020. Um, definitely, you know, the yeah. more the better. But it's really Absolutely. important not only for the life of the seas, but it's also important for food security because one-fifth of the world's protein comes from fish from the ocean. So it's a huge, it's a huge source of um, food for a lot of people. Well, we've got about three, three and a half minutes left, maybe, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> to talk about somebody else from the book. Yeah. Well, you know, I know you, you wanted me to close and, you know, talk about someone special. And to me, the really special, special people are all the people that I met. And part of the reason that is because one of the things that I really wasn't aware of before I started traveling was how many people in so many different cultural and geographic circumstances are working so hard to save the life of the seas, but also the life of the earth. And the one big thing that really hit me towards the end of the, my research for this book was, I started to realize this is the largest social movement in history. This is huge. And it was amazing to meet people who were Christian or Muslim, or they were in Southeast Asia, or they were in Europe. I think we have a picture, yeah. <laughs> and like, these people really made an impression on me because of their diversity, but also their dedication. And I like to call them the faces of ocean country. Wow. And there are many people there, there are, 
the dynamite fishermen who forsook dynamite fishing to do it for their children, even though it meant earning less money. There's a woman, Elizabeth Vallée, that I admire very much in Paris, who works uh, making supply chains sustainable. And she explained to me over and over again to do something like that. Everybody needs to be engaged. So it's really not one person. It's the marriage of multiples, um, the force of meeting all those different people around the world. Uh, you must have a diary that long, and you must have enough material for several more books, I would imagine. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which I'm sure um, well, you're going to be back diving pretty soon, right? Well, I think my big dive right now is reaching out to the public because mm. the issues are so ur urgent. I really, I'd love to go run away and get back in the field with my notebook, but I feel like the issues are so urgent, especially climate change that where I belong right now is just reaching out to as many people as I can and sharing the experience that I had. Well, it seems like you were very well received by most of the people that you encountered, and I think that's wonderful um, that you were. Uh, it seems like it was to me. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I just want to thank you so much for being here. I really, really appreciate that. And I'd like to remind everybody out there that we really have to be mindful of what we put into the ocean and what we take out of the ocean. I would like to thank everybody out there that's working to help preserve this beautiful ocean that we have. It's a tremendous renewable resource and we need to, to guard it. So um, check the website for more details and thanks for watching the show. Watch again.